So this month of September, our worship theme is welcome. Welcome home, welcome in, welcome change, welcome the unwelcome, welcome grief, and welcome forgiveness in our lives. Of course, it's with this intention that forgiveness is tied with the spiritual practice of welcoming forgiveness. At sundown tonight, the holiest of Judaism's holy days, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement begins. I've asked Paul Liebert, member of our congregation, to tell us more about Yom Kippur and the theology of forgiveness, which he will do in a little while. He comes from, he comes from a Jewish background and identity, and so he can speak authentically to it, and I appreciate you doing this, Paul. But first, let's explore what I mean by bringing hospitality full circle in the act of forgiveness. When I think of welcome, I think of hospitality. And when I think of hospitality, I'm not talking about the hostess with the mostess or hosting a party or entertaining. But hospitality is a really important aspect of right relationship. To give and receive hospitality, there must be a wholeness, or I like to say, you know, W-H-O-L is, is the same as W-O, or H-O-L-I, wholeness and holiness in relationship between host and guest, between people, really. And this means that the host welcome it, welcomes in all, all, of whom the guest arrives as unconditionally. And the guest in turn accepts all of whom the host is and what the host offers. And that's not an easy thing to do. It's much easier said than done. But one thing there is, or two things there are in this way of being hospitable, is graciousness and expansiveness. And when those qualities are present in the giving and receiving of hospitality, the relationship is whole or holy. The difference between hospitality as entertainment and hospitality as welcome lies in the quality of the relationship between people or between a person say, and their experiences in life. The person who wholeheartedly welcomes change, chaos, or grief in their life is likely to recover and heal more quickly than the person who runs from it. Now, this running away or slamming the door on welcome, on unwelcome change, is personified in Jonah. And Jonah is a figure in the, in the Hebrew scriptures. Now he, as a character, is a prophet, but he's not a prophet among prophets, the prophets of Israel. He's, this story is actually in the wisdom literature. So Jonah's story is really a, a story, a, a, like a cautionary tale. And it begins with a divine call to go to the city of Nineveh and persuade the people there to repair their relationship between themselves, each other, and with the God of Israel. But Jonah does not feel hospitable at all toward the people of Nineveh. As a matter of fact, he's pretty judgmental about them. And he can't understand why he's being sent to, quote unquote, save them or help them repair their bad relations. So he runs away. And eventually, he's compelled to complete his task by being coughed up onto the shore of the city by a big fish. Now, unbelievably, Jonah still refuses to even ask the people of Nineveh to repent, which, by the way, means repair or healing becoming whole again. So once again, the God of Israel must intervene. And while Jonah pouts outside the city walls, 
the whole city, the king, and even the animals, it says, have donned sackcloth and are sitting in ashes, an act of contrition. So you, I think that you all also must understand that there is an element of irony here, right? And it is to underscore the, uh, the, the lost opportunity, uh, Jonah's lost opportunity to be in, to be uh, knowing somebody that he doesn't know and um, extending hospitality and receiving it at the same time. So there is the, the, the animals donning the sackcloth is meant to be ironic humor. Um, in this story, Jonah is the epitome of a person who refuses to be hospitable and forgiving and therefore is in need of healing and wholeness himself. In the story, it's the God of Israel who demonstrates patience and a wide mercy. And ironically, it's the people of Nineveh who demonstrate the completed circle of forgiveness. The king asks forgiveness for himself and his people, which is granted, and wholeness and right relationship are restored. But not Jonah. He's sitting out there under the mustard tree that God had put there for him to shade him. And we can guess that he has some internal work to do. Now, while some of us as Unitarian Universalists are, are allergic to the words repentance and sin, what sin really means is separation. Separation within oneself as brokenness, separation from each other, from others, um, through um, uh, disrepair of a relationship. And repentance means repair to become whole again when the circle of forgiveness is complete. That means that either I acknowledge a wrong I've done to somebody else, I seek their forgiveness, and that forgiveness is granted. Okay. Also, I could, uh, as I'm going to tell you in a story, um, ask somebody uh, for an apology. So Unitarian Universalist theology and values call us to be in right relationship with one another. The principles in the inherent worth of the inherent worth and dignity of every person justice, equity, and compassion in our human relations, and respect for the interdependent web of all existence, these are the values that call us to right relationship. But we must remember that in order to be in right relationship with others, we need to be whole, wholehearted, and repaired within ourselves. And at the same time, let me stop and say that this right, seeking this right relationship, no matter which side of this forgiveness atonement equation you are on, it has to be sincere and authentic. And it can't be done in a one way uh, or wishing it was so. So I'm going to say next that to be in right relationship means that we bring ourselves into the relationship as whole as we can possibly be, right? But we're human beings. And I've yet to meet a human being who is in an unbroken condition. I'm gonna, I'm gonna qualify that with, with saying mostly as adults. Um, from, from, from birth to adulthood, you, you get to practice what it means to, to, to be, uh, to be either whole or broken. So all of us, all of us have places within us in need of repair. And sometimes it's because we haven't completed that circle of forgiveness. We haven't brought hospitality full circle in our relationships. 
And I think often by the way we practice apology, forgiveness, and forgiveness, we unwittingly create little broken places within ourselves like a paper, like a thousand paper cuts. For example, we say, I'm sorry, forgive me, I, I, I beg your pardon, excuse me, I regret that, my apologies. And we respond with, oh, it's okay, no worries, it was nothing, couldn't be helped, it's not your fault, no apology necessary. Don't we do that a lot? These are banal, trite, throwaway exchanges of hurt and pardon that we volley at each other a lot in our daily lives, whether we're at home in our families, in public with, in public with strangers, or socializing with friends. So there are indeed some hurts that are so slight like literally stepping on somebody's toe, for which an apology and a word of forgiveness can, can appropriately be tossed over the shoulder. But too often we employ the lightweight exchange when we should be taking the time, the effort, the courage to be truly reconciled in a full circle of seeking forgiveness and offering atonement on one side and accepting atonement and granting forgiveness on the other side. In a congregation I once served, the long-standing patriarch dubbed me with a nickname, K2. So my name is Kathy 2 Ricky, and my middle name is T-E-W. So, he called me K2. He never addressed me by my given name, nor did he ever address me by title. And after a time, it wore on me. It, it felt diminishing. But I never had the courage to tell him so and to ask him to call me Kathy. You, no, you don't have to call me Reverend Kathy but at least call me Kathy. Please don't call me K2, okay? <laughs> but you know, that was a missed opportunity. That was a failure of courage on my part, right? And I never will because he died. He died before I left that congregation. So there is a place of disrepair. Granted, it's a paper cut, right? but a place of disrepair in me. I can't heal because I can't ask him to make amends. So is there anything I can do to bring the circle of forgiveness to a close? Well, the answer is no, but now I'm gonna invite Paul up to explain why in terms of Jewish theology, and practice. So Paul, why don't you go ahead and come on up here because this is the best microphone. Thank you. Hey Fritz, good to see you. Feeling better? Good. Next time use a match. <laughs> I can't see the words anymore. Okay. Yom Kippur, the Jewish Day of Atonement, begins tonight at sunset. Jews all over the world pray to God, seeking forgiveness for their sins. And it's understood that if the repentance is sincere, then one sins against God, against God, will be forgiven. But there's a catch. It's always a catch. God will not forgive one's sins committed against another person. Only that person can forgive those sins. So 
very often during the 10 days between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, there's a flurry of activity in which sinners seek out persons they have transgressed against to ask for their forgiveness. Jewish tradition requires, if the repentance is sincere, for the offended party to forgive the offending party. If they do not, the sinner is off the hook. But once again, a catch. What if the person cannot be found? Or if they are deceased? How does the sinner gain forgiveness for their sins? Or do they have to carry them forever? The problems of sin, atonement, and forgiveness is common to all religions. German theologian Paul Tillich, he's a Lutheran, right, Fred? Yes, he is. He still is? He's still, he's still around? No, I don't think so. Okay. Uh, understood sin as separation or estrangement between man and God, however defined between two or more persons, and ultimately within the sinner, him or herself. Similarly, repentance and forgiveness results in healing that separation, resulting in a wholeness of the soul and psyche, a unity of God, the individual, and the world. As you use, we seek the healing of the world, but we must begin with healing ourselves. Reverend Kathy has created a two-step process, which she shall describe, in which we symbolically free ourselves from the burdens of unforgiven sin and of living as victims of someone else be they parents, spouses, children, siblings, or other close relationship, or anyone else for that matter who have harmed us. For those who choose to do so, they can seek forgiveness in this process against those who we have offended, who you have offended who are no longer here to grant forgiveness. By doing this, you free yourself, free ourselves from the guilt, pain, and alienation you experience, or we experience in that relationship. Then, second part, those who choose to do so can forgive those who have sinned against you regardless of whether that person or persons ha has sought has sought your forgiveness, and regardless they are even alive to receive it. You do not do this. You do this not for the person who has harmed you, but for yourself. You do it for ourselves. By doing this, we release our anger, our resentment, our victimhood. We heal the separation. We achieve wholeness. Reverend Kathy will now take us through this process. Thank, thank you, Paul. And Stephen, if you'll hold off just a few more minutes, I want to explain what this is an invitation. Do not feel compelled to do this if you don't feel comfortable doing it. So 
I originally conceived this as a burning bowl. So you probably all know what that is. You, do, you write on a piece of flash paper something you want to let go of and put it in a bowl of sand and, plat and it just goes up with no, no flame at all. I can't find, um, couldn't find any um, flash paper. So this is actually much safer. This is, this is water soluble paper which, by the way, my husband says used to be illegal because book, uh, illegal bookmakers, bookie, bookie, bookers, bookies use these. Anyway, <laughs> I got it. I, bookmakers used. I got this on, on Amazon, so apparently that's no longer so. I get, yeah, well, that makes sense, right, in this technological age. Anyway, here are strips of water-soluble paper. Pencil writes very well on it. I experimented with it yesterday. And so what I would do is I would write a note to that patriarch and I would ask um, for his apology or I would say, I regret I didn't ask for your apology. And then I'm going to put it in the bowl and let it go. Can you go to the next slide, Raj? So I did make, I, I, I made two sides just simply so you would have access to some place to write in pencils and, um, but the two bowls, the bowl on the left is a wrong you committed against another and you're seeking forgiveness. And the bowl on the right is a wrong done to you and unatoned for. And these are situations. Now, this is not, if this person is available to you, to, I'm going to say according to Jewish theology, correct? If this person is available to you, you will be written in, in, the, in the book of life only if you have actually gone to that person, right? This doesn't count for that. But what we're doing here is we are, it's a ritual of letting go of those things that we hold, we tend to hold on to. And we, we really, how often do you have a space or a place where you can do this, where you can let go of grievances, or you can let go of your uh, missed opportunity to apologize. So, I'm trying to decide. Um, so uh, the fact that this is water soluble, right? Don't get it wet before you put it in the bowl because you'll be amazed at how fast it goes, it falls apart. This is also something you're gonna do in, in, your, in your own quiet space. You're not gonna share verbally. And um, Paul says that it, it might help if you can, imagine the person but because you know memory kind of brings people back alive for us however i'm relying on you to take care of yourselves and if you you know want to go to that a place where you can't come back from don't go there okay and um i'm always available if you need me. That's a really good question. It says you're facing the, the, the chancel, yes. And, and if you get it mixed up, you're forgiven. <laughs> so whenever you're ready, you can come up here and you can either take a piece of paper and a pencil and take it back to your seat and write it or write it up here, all right? And then place it in the bowl. Paul, you got any additional? Yeah. So whenever you're ready, it doesn't matter which podium you go to. I just wanted to keep this paper in plastic until the time came. And now Stephen can play the music.
I had forgotten to print out these wonderful words by Jay Abernathy around this um, ceremony, which really um, speaks uh, well to what we've done here today. And also, um, Rajiv, have you got, can you, um, can you grab some paper and write names? Okay. So on Zoom, we ask people, of course, not to share their specific um, uh, seeking, but to uh, give us their names, and we will put their names into the uh, bowls. All our lives, we have been told to seek that which is good, to turn our faces from dark toward the light, toward beauty, toward truth. But the truth is that the world is not always good. The light we seek casts shadows and there is brokenness amid the beauty. Our world is far from perfect and so are we. We strive to be in right relations with one another, but there are times when we are left angry or disappointed, even as we sometimes anger or disappoint others. We cannot seek truth, beauty, and light without acknowledging and affirming that which is false, broken, and in shadow. For all of these exist within us as well. So let us take another moment of silence And within our hearts, forgive others, forgive ourselves, and forgive yet again. And like the fibers of this paper, may they fall away. May you let it go in the disintegrating fibers of these paper. Let us understand, take the word, work of forgiving ourselves and each other that we may begin again in love. Blessed be.